get up, get, get up, get up. What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to episode number 119 of the Mets Up Podcast, the official podcast of the New York Mets. Not, not necessarily a happy episode, not one we're too excited to record here at 1130 on Thursday night because those Atlanta Braves, they did beat us in a four-game series down in hot and steamy Atlanta with a night game on a Thursday where the Mets have to fly back to Philly. I don't even know how that's possible, but we'll go into that during this podcast not great vibes right now going on in Met World. I think that's a little ridiculous. We both think that's a little bit crazy. We're going to have a nice little therapy session. We're going to go through all the games. We're going to tell you what we liked, what we didn't like. Going to be nice and nice and calming for you guys. Hopefully on this Friday morning when you're listening to this, going to work, you'll be able to relax a little bit and not want to punch your radio in your car. But that being said, if you guys do like what we're doing over here, make sure you are following us on all our social media, at Mets Up. That's going to be Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. If you're looking for the YouTube video, it's over on the New York Mets YouTube channel. Just go subscribe over there and watch that on their channel. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, wherever you find it, drop us a rating, a review, download, and subscribe. We do appreciate you guys. Let's go ahead and bring in James. James, how are we feeling? We're feeling okay. It's a it's a blessing to get to this point in the season and be able to count every single series loss and be able to actually be able to recount them like individually. Yeah. We remember the Padres. We remember the Mariners. We, the Mariners. We remember the Astros. We remember splitting a four game set with the Braves in May. And I do believe that was all of them. Correct. I think that's it. I don't. I don't think there's any other sprinkled in there. The Mets. You, you know, all things considered have been a pretty good team this year, despite what some people maybe on the social media would like to say. No, oh, yeah. In the Mets case, historically great in terms of their franchise history. But also, I want to open the show with a bit of a disclaimer for the listeners at home. Some people, maybe of the more acute listeners, will be able to hear that there is very loud reggaeton music that is coming on mm. near my apartment. I live in Brooklyn. It's a hot summer night. People like to party sometimes. This crew has been on the sidewalk, literally right outside my door, basically, <laughs> partying since I got home from work tonight around 6 o'clock. Loud oh. music, a hookah, plenty of modellos getting passed around. So you might hear that and just have solace in knowing that we're recording this right now, 1130, and I probably won't be sleeping until 2 or 3. So Yeah, you're going to be on uh, you're gonna be on my time schedule here, going to bed at like 2, 30, 3 o'clock. Yeah, but not waking up at 11. No, yeah, you have to wake up. <laughs> you have to wake up at a reasonable time for a job. Capitalist James. Oh, God, yeah, but it's just... I understand Mets fans' fear with watching this series and how it unfolded and, like, thinking that something's going to happen, like, something bad's going to happen, but I just kind of, you have to find, kind of take solace in, like, what we've built up this entire year and just the fact that this is the first divisional series that we've lost, 16 series played, and I think the fifth all year, as we just went through, right? The, the Padres twice, two Padres, Mariners, Astros. Astros twice, technically. Astros twice, technically. I guess you're right. So it's the sixth. Technically, the yeah. sixth one we've lost all year. Which, like, I mean, it's really hard to watch this series and not say it wasn't disappointing. Like, I even put out a tweet. Yeah, I didn't say it wasn't disappointing. It was certainly yeah. disappointing. No, it was, it was definitely disappointing, and you hope the Mets would have fared a lot better. Like, especially if we would have split the game, the series and won on Thursday with DeGrom on the mound, I think nobody cares. I think this episode feels completely different. Of course. Different. If we split this series after, also people have forgotten because the series is a four-game series, that we lost our starting pitcher after two innings. Yeah, in the first, in the first, in the first two games of the series. So that's automatically two losses. You lose your starting pitcher in the second inning, a third inning technically, against a Major League Baseball team that's not playing in one of the Central Divisions. <laughs> you're you're going you're 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 probably going to lose. So the fact that we even got close enough to tie the series up, and again, it's with our two aces. You should, probably should have won both of these games. You feel that way, but Max Reed versus Jacob Degrom is not exactly a game where you have like the most sound advantage in the world. And this Braves team is good, and we saw the depth in their lineup in these in this entire series, and how important that is. I like to take shots at Garrett Cole that he's not a big game pitcher. Max Freed is a big game pitcher. I feel like yeah, that really. dude steps up big time. Like coming off a concussion too. Got to give him some credit there. He pitched a really good game. Uh, so much both, so. We both said the finally he wasn't going to pitch this year. I was shocked when he came back in time. I mean, apparently uh, Snicker went to him and was like, how are you feeling? He's like, oh, I'm pitching. They were like, you can just wait until like Friday. He's like, no, 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 I'm pitching tonight, which you got to respect that. But also I hate the Braves so much. I dislike that team. I hate Atlanta. It's just... Playing this team is so infuriating, and I really do think that, like, on top of the series loss that it is to the Braves, is probably what is making people go up a wall right now. 
I think it's making people go up a wall just because we've seen so many Mets divisional races in our lifetimes. That could be any lifetime that we're talking about here. Well, that's that's kind of funny to say, too, because, like, we've seen so many Mets divisional races. Like, relatively speaking, we actually haven't seen No, many. I'm not saying divisional. I'm saying so, I'm, I'm saying supposed divisional races, and this could be yeah. any month of the year. Divisional race starts in April, Mark. That's true. I forgot. It's every, yeah. every game one counts exact same as game 162 here. <laughs> I want to throw up. This, I mean, this is why we were ha- we were hassling in, like, our, a- our April episode. Before anything was going on with the Mets, we were like, I can't believe Trevor Williams pitching against Juan Soto in the eighth inning because every yeah. single individual game matters a lot in baseball. Like, it'd be great to have one more game on the Braves right now. But alas, this is just something that kind of – Mets fans just all have PTSD. Like, there's no way around it. Like, we've seen leads get blown in May. We've seen leads get blown in June, July. Like, that's it. This team isn't aren't, isn't those teams, though, and those teams weren't the teams before them. Like, every single season is independent. Every single season is different. So Mets fans have this fear of something they think they're used to seeing. But – that is where the fear comes from. I don't think it's as much of a fact of like what's actually in front of us. I mean, we've seen that the at least the Mets players respond really well because I what was it back a month ago, right when the sky was supposedly falling, as you have people going crazy on your street. But I remember when the sky was supposedly falling about a month ago, and I think it was Tomas Nito. Like the next day, they came out and played really well. He's like, yeah, like you know, everyone told us that the season was over, but like we just keep playing our game. We know we're good. And I think the Mets. I don't think there's any confidence that's wavering amongst the team. But it would be nice if we kind of stopped the the narrative of like the Mets are choking because like 33 games above 500. This is, what, the second best start in Mets franchise history to a season? Granted, it's not really a start anymore because we're like 100-plus yeah, games in. I, I would say the second best through, I think, is 116 or 117 games we are right now. Yeah, so like... Only worse than 1986 Mets and by about two or three games. I don't hate people being upset about losing because I think you have a right to be upset. It's frustrating to lose this series. I was frustrated myself, but... The idea of like, oh, same old Mets, it's happening again, blah, blah, blah. Like, when's the, when's the last time the Mets were 33 games above 500 at this point? Oh, 1986, that team won the World Series. I'm not saying that this team is going to win the World Series because of that, but the idea that this Mets team is not good or is, is choking or is doing the classic thing that they always do, like, it doesn't actually make any intellectual sense. No, especially because, like we said before, you were so down and out the first two games of the series just based on bad luck. Yeah. Like first of all, you go into game one of, the, one of the series. You get news before the game that Luis Guillorme, who's become quietly one of the most important players to this roster, because super his, valuable his positional flexibility, the fact that he can play shortstop at a high level, second base and third base as well. You're not going to have him until the middle of September. That's yeah. a that's a major blow. Then he's also, I feel like, become kind of this. It's hard to call him an emotional leader because he's not really an outspoken individual, but he's someone who I think the team can lean on. Like he's someone who like if no one's got me, like Yorme's got me. Like he's a steadying force, I'm sure, on like more of an on-field presence than anything. And you lose that, you're like, okay, now we need someone else because like he does like four jobs in one roster spot. Yes, and this is something we said in the offseason why he was so valuable to this team and why a lot of this roster construction has kind of happened hilariously so to say it's out loud but around what Luis Guillorme can do as a bench piece yeah like it's true but it has like he gives you so many more options to build out a roster so losing him before that game was a little bit of a gut punch Carrasco getting hit early wasn't good either going through the rain delay Carrasco coming back out and then grabbing his side all of a sudden you like you just felt like you were spinning before the yeah. series even began like it felt like you were going to fall down. Like it was just, it was hard to watch. It was a lot to take in over a short period of time. It stunk. Braves voodoo magic, whatever it is. I don't know. Alex Anthopoulos is over there cooking up some concoctions. What are they doing? Like, is there, has there been a luckier team in baseball over this entire generation than the Atlanta (laughs) Braves? No, no, we can't say lucky. We can't do that. We can't play the luck card. I'll I'll play voodoo magic, but as two podcast co-hosts who gave Spencer Strider a lot of flack about, and by the way, I said flack that time. You see that? You got that Give one right. a lot yeah. of flack. I got it right. We can, we can't use the lucky card, but I will drop voodoo magic because my grandma, she's Greek. Shout out to Yaya. Uh, she she's got some magic in her. Like if I feel sick, she can like cast a spell, and I feel instantly better. I can't explain it. She's got like a, a sixth sense or whatever. Alex Anthopoulos, a Greek man himself, I think he's doing it, but just for evil purposes, honestly. Or he's just giving the Braves good vibes. Something weird's going on. It's been happening for the last two years. I don't like it. Like Robbie Grossman hitting from the left-handed side. Dude, Robbie Grossman hitting from the left-hand side. The fact that two Mets starting pitchers got injured before the third inning in back-to-back games. Like, how the heck does that happen? Like, oh, that's so frustrating. And like Taiwan on such a freak one, too. Like, he just like went over and covered first. And then all of a sudden was like, oh, wow, that 
That feels Harris. horrible. He's, I think he said it was the worst pain he's ever been in, which is quite something to say considering he's had Tommy John and a lot of sur- you know surgeries <laughs> and injuries in his career. But then he also went on to say, he's like, I also can't believe how great I feel today. Like That's just, that's crazy. I mean, glad that he seemingly avoided major injury, upset about Carrasco. I think that's a month, right? Yeah. But it was also a situation with Carrasco where he was probably approaching a, le- a level of innings that you didn't really want him to get to this inning. So maybe if I have to find a silver lining is that he, he you, you store up some innings for when the going's going to get tougher in late October, possibly early yeah. November. But it's just like to get that kind of gut punch and have to deal with Darren Ruff on the mound, RJ Alvarez, Steven Agosik. Shout out those all three of those guys, though. Wait, did you – were you watching the game or were you listening to the radio? I was radio most of the series. Okay, so you Tuesday, might not have Tuesday, caught this. I watched this. a lot of Tuesday. I watched most of Tuesday. You might not have caught this, but RJ Alvarez came into this game, as you guys know, after Carrasco got hurt. R.J. Alvarez had not pitched in Major League Baseball since 2015. Holy shit. You, he faced Michael Harris, who was born in 2001. Michael Harris was 14 years old, a freshman in high school, the last time R.J. Alvarez threw a Major League Baseball pitch. That's crazy. The yeah, Alvarez is the Walker game. I know, but we... Or Alvarez is the Walker game. I, yeah, my bad. They, no, of course. We're combining these first two games because they're both yeah. poop fest to bring back our coin term. And also, like, in these games... Again, I said it before, hat tip to R.J. Alvarez, Steven Nagosik, and Darren Ruff for saving this bullpen, giving our yeah. A-team a chance to get to these last two games, a chance to win both of them. And just another hat tip to Charlie Morton, just being yeah. an absolute legend, 38 years old, throwing 97 miles an hour with that curveball. We, we we had a part of his best start of the year, so really glad to see him rounding into form at the time. <laughs> yeah, he, he was, his control and his stuff was so nasty in game two. I mean, like you said, it was another poop fest because of the pitcher thing too, but he was spot on. Like, I can't. You can get mad sometimes when you watch Mets hitters not hit a Chase Anderson, like we've said in the past. But Charlie Morton, who isn't having a great year, you wouldn't have been able to tell that from that game because he was just, he was unbelievable. Like you said, one of the best starts he's made all season. He was. The Mets could do nothing in this game against him. But we should leave these two games in the dust and yeah. now kind of break down games three and four because these were intense baseball games. The Braves knew it. The Mets knew it. Scherzer and DeGrom on the mound. The Braves were able to counter Max Fried. Uh, in the fourth game, and it was it really had an intense playoff like atmosphere. Well, first we also have to talk about the big news that came before Game Three, well, that was which it. was our boy, former guest of the Mets Up podcast, friend uh, of TikTok, the program, yeah, friend of the program, TikTok viral star. Uh, thanks to our TikTok there, Brett Beatty called up third base for the New York Mets, making his first start. It was very exciting. Everyone on Mets Twitter was buzzing, including ourselves, maybe. We, we, we buzzed. We really buzzed. We were really happy to be, uh, for a little while, to be one of the first people of that news, jumping on the, <laughs> the train with uh, Jeff Pass and Mike Mayer, who got it first. But it was just a really nice moment because Mets Twitter was kind of exploding the day before with yeah. him not getting called up. And people were kind of upset because it seemed like the Mets really had a gaping hole at third base. And he's... He's major league ready, as we've learned recently. So it was a little frustrating to see him not get the call, especially after seeing these young Braves playing so well. Yeah. They did get that call, made his major league debut on Wednesday. And it was as storybook a debut as I remember for any player ever in a Mets uniform. It was awesome. I think he joined, He hit a home run in his first at bat, in case you guys didn't know. I mean, Second you knew pitch. this. Second pitch. I think he was the first one since Mike Jacobs to do it. And then before that, it was Kaz Matsui. So some elite company there for Brett Beatty. I think his I, career trajectory is a little better than those guys. I as remember well. Both of those. I oh, think I was vividly. At, I think I was at both of those. Well, I remember Kaz did it at home. That was 2000. Opening day. It yes, opening, opening day. day. I was I was 100% at that game. Oh, he said Kaz in did Atlanta. it in Atlanta, John. Yeah, in Atlanta. Wow. He did it in Atlanta. You want to know why? I believe the next year, he also hit another home run on opening day. I'm not Maybe even that joking. that was it. Because that was Pedro's first game as a man. I remember I was at that game. Opening day 2005. Yeah. Yes, I was at that game. He did in his first at bat three straight seasons, a producer John is telling us right now. That, yeah, Kaz, that's one of the crazy stats in baseball history. And the fact that John's pulling that from memory... That's even crazier. I knew the two years. I didn't know about the third year, but I think the third year he wasn't with the Mets, if I recall. I think that might have been when he went to the Astros. But regardless, like, I, and Mike Jacobs was, I believe, in Arizona, right? You said you remember it vividly uh, there, James. Oh, I thought I thought that was home. I think Jacobs was a home game. I'm pretty sure I was there. It was home? Okay. Was it against yes. the Marlins? I think it was against the Marlins. Okay, ah. now, okay. You know what? He had a he had a huge series in Arizona when they like did, did a trip, and I was like, he's so good. It's not just like one at bat. He's really really good. And then Mike Jacobs happened. First Nats. Nat, I mean, was Expos? You mean? 
No, two, like, it would have been like 2005. So yeah, it would have been 2005. Nats. That's Nationals. Yeah. Wow. You're just having a conversation with our note, our notes. <laughs> right this is now. like this is like this is like speaking to like Stephen Hawking. <laughs> We're doing a podcast right now. You're, I know. You remember that? <laughs> You're kind talking of. to the notes. We literally I asked are. you a que- I asked you a question before, and you just completely ignored me. Me? Yeah. What'd you say? Uh, I was talking about like you know whatever was going on in the game with Brett Beatty, Mike Jacobs, Kaz Matsui, and you were just looking at me, and I was like, no, and you were like, I'm reading. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, John was actively typing. I wanted to see what he said. It's like it's like Interstellar. Matthew McConaughey was talking to himself in the future. Like I want to see what he's saying. Even Spoilers, though we can't see man. Him. I haven't seen Interstellar. Oh, I'm sorry. My Never we'll will. Do one, we'll do one spoiler an episode from now on to yeah. keep this one going. But but yeah, move on. Seeing Beatty, though, just be able to do that, just, like, having the confidence of taking... And also going with a breaking ball, like, pulling, getting the bat head on a breaking ball like that. Not that Jake Odorizzi is any kind of world beater here, but he's a major no. league pitcher, kind of, at this point, I guess. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but, I don't know, just seeing him attack a breaking ball and get the bat head on it. But breaking ball outside, find a way to pull it, and seeing the family go crazy, it was a real special moment, man. Yeah, part of a hot start for the Mets in this game, where uh, we got the home run for Marte. We got the Francisco Lindor home run. The Mets were out early against Jake Odorizzi, which was great. Like you said, the first two games stunk a lot. We were feeling bad. With the Beatty news, it feels like things were turning the corner. Ultimately, the Mets did turn the corner in this game and were able to have a really good one, but it did get interesting as well, and Scherzer was still great. It did. I want to talk about Scherzer first because while he was on the mound, he was still as casually dominant as he always is. The Braves scratched one across the third inning, top of the order, second time through. I think Dansby had a sack fly after a couple of base hits. Yeah. But six and the third innings for Scherzer, eight strikeouts, three walks, get to that, and three earned runs. We'll get to that because some issues did arrive in the seventh inning for Scherzer. He started the inning with 77 pitches and was totally cruising. Struck out Alston to start the inning. And then he walked Eddie Rosario on four pitches. And there's two things that's pretty shocking about that. <laughs> yeah, the two, first two one big ones. is just simply walking Eddie Rosario, let alone on four pitches. Because Eddie Rosario's <laughs> been allergic to walks his entire career. It's really plagued his career out. He could have been a pretty amazing perennial all-star if he knew how to do that. Secondly, it's because that was Max Scherzer's first four-pitch walk in a Mets uniform. It's crazy. Whole season. First time that happened. And then after that... Vaughn Grissom hit a number by the mound. He couldn't make a play. As we know from game four, Vaughn Grissom has some wheels. That guy yep. is really annoyingly good, and it's really making me upset. And then Max Scherzer walks Michael Harris on four pitches. So now in one inning, the first two four-pitch walks his entire season. So you're like, okay, something's wrong. Buck comes out of the dugout, takes him out of the game. Adam, Adam Alavino comes in to face the eight and nine hitters in the Braves order. At this point, the game was six to, six to one. Yeah. Six to one, and Alavino gives up. Oh, no, wait. The Gris- That wasn't a Grissom number. Grissom got the infield single to score the run right after this. It was it? I don't when know. Alvino came we're, we're focused too much on the little details. Yes, but there was, in- there was an infield single that scored the run, and then Robbie Grossman hitting from the left side off Alvino hit a just crushed one. Yeah. And um, I sunk. I sunk. Again, you are probably listening to the radio. On TV, uh, Keith, Keith, oh, Keith got me good. I was hot. I was hot. Keith on the broadcast when Adovino comes into the game. First thing out of his mouth is, got to keep the ball in the ballpark here. And I was like, Keith, what are we doing, guy? I didn't even know he and said like, that. I mean, a few pitches later, like you said, crushed it over the wall. I, w- I was so hot. I was like, Keith, I love you. But as a, as a baseball guy, you got to know that that was just, that was doomed from the start. You can't say that. I remember in our text chat, you were also saying that Keith was talking about Max going eight. Like, he yeah, was he was. Seventh. Yeah. But he was cruising to that point. 77 pitchers through six, you're like, this is you're you're in as good of a spot as you could be. We know the jinx is so powerful, especially in Mets world. I mean, so not to rub salt in the wound here, Jane, but you did say we didn't lose a series against the NL East in the last podcast, in the last episode. I did say that you're right. So yeah. so there's that. There's me with mentioning stuff that we've done in the past. I mean, like, we have to remember, like, some like, facts are facts. I can't You're get you on a fact. You're also forgetting that I, I drink the crap out of this game as well. Because oh, for I, sure, yeah. I, I want to take a day off from, t- from like, kind of paying attention to the game. So I, I had the Mets game, like, on the game cast. I listened to a couple of things on the radio. I was hanging out with a friend. And, um, and I was riding my bike home, and I got just brained on. It started pouring for, like, half hour in the city. And I was like, all right, whatever. I have some cover. There's a dive bar right over here. Shout out to Brooklyn Safe House. Treated me well for a while I was in there. And, um... I'm going to watch the game. And I was watching during this blow-up. Mark yeah. like, yeah, I turned it off. I was like, I left, I left, I left. I couldn't like watch he, it anymore. It's like, you cannot be watching this. You can't tell us you're going to take one for the team and not watch and then all of a sudden be like, I'm watching and they're giving up runs. But yeah, it, it was the most stressful 6-1 game I can remember in a long time. Well, it very quickly became 6-5. And then Edwin Diaz was able to come in the eighth inning, make light work of the middle of the Braves order. He's so good. 
It's crazy. He's very locked in right now. And then Alonzo and Vogel back got his insurance. Things felt mm-hmm. okay. Things felt okay enough to take Edmund Diaz out of the game. Trevor May made a sweat again, but got out of it, won the game, got this one. And really, you got to give it up to the Mets bats in this game. He scored nine runs, 19 mm-hmm. hard-hit balls. Every single starter had multiple hard hit balls except for Jeff and Vogie, and I think they each at least had one hit, if not multiple hits. And Brett Beatty hit a fielder's choice to Dansby Swanson in this game, 113 miles an hour. The hardest a left-handed hitter has hit a ball off of a left-handed pitcher in the StatCast era since 2015. Is that for the Mets or just in, that's got to be for the Mets, right? Not all Maybe, baseball. I I remember I read this from the Tacomo tweet. And I thought he insinuated this was the whole shebang. Maybe it was just Mets. I'll try to pull it up right now while you talk about something else. But. Yeah, no, that, that stat is cool, though, regardless if it's Mets or, you know, in all of baseball. It'd be even cooler. Watching Brett Beatty, Keith is drooling. And I oh got to say, Keith Keith knows his hitters. He, he, he saw Conforto, and he was very high on him at the start. And obviously, Conforto had a really good career with the Mets. Brett Beatty. By a Met left-handed hitter, by the way. Okay. Not all of them. Yeah, that makes more sense. Brett Beatty, though, he's like, man. I love the way this kid swings. In game four, there were Gary said, does his swing and stance remind you a little bit about Christian Yelich? And Keith goes, oh, I think he's better than Yelich. And I was like, let's go, Keith. Like, I'm all for it. I'm all on the Brett Beatty bandwagon. I think his I don't think were, his swing reminds me of Yelich. I, I don't necessarily think it does by any means. I think he's a lefty who's tall and, does. like, a little thin. Yeah, um, no, but I don't think Beatty's even as thin as Yelich. I think Yelich kind of uses his arms more to swing, and Beatty seems to use more wrist, if you understand what I'm saying with that. Yeah. Beatty seems to get the bat head out, while, like, Yelich kind of seems to survive with, the, like, that like that nice plane. I don't know. It seems a little different to me. I, yeah, I don't think their swings are real, particularly that similar. I think, like, you could see it in the stance, but I don't think, like, they're the same type of hitter. But regardless, I was really impressed with Brett Beatty. I think he's looked really good so far. I think his, like, discipline at the plates looked really good. He's come up against a ton of lefties with runners in scoring yeah. position, and I haven't really remembered a bat at bat for a guy who could definitely be trying to do too much in a big situations, in a big spot, in a pennant race. Well, I was going to say poise, too. Like, he just seems like he very much belongs right away. And I tweeted that after he hit the home run because he just, like, just seemed like it was another day at the office for him. Like, he didn't, the moment wasn't too big. He just came up and was like, I I can do this. Like, this is the level I should be playing at. I'm excited to be playing here. I think that that's what we can take the most solace in from this, yeah. these couple of Brit games of Brett Beatty debuting. It's like the, it's just, the moment wasn't too great. And, of course, it's good, there's going to be some rookie struggles, but he just seems really, really comfortable. He... The the call up of him right now reminds me a lot of 2015 when Michael Conforto got the call up when Kadir went down and Kadir yeah. was out and Michael Conforto didn't give up that spot after he came up it was his I don't necessarily know if that's going to always necessarily be the case I mean Eduardo Escobar has a spot on this team but if Brett Beatty keeps playing like this he's he's playing every single day like he's playing really well at the plate even if the numbers aren't necessarily like crazy and against two games so the sample is extremely small but the quality of bats that he's given have been so good especially against tough lefties like AJ Minter I think he had a good at bat against in the in the eighth or whatever it was it's also just the quality of contact I think he already has like four hard hit balls and nine at bats yeah like that's num- that's an unbelievable ratio right now and also, did you see the video that the seven line posted about Escobar interacting with Beatty yes I did that yeah, was so- awesome for the people at home, when Beatty was coming out for his first inning in the field, because he got in the field before he came up to the plate, Escobar was on the top step, like hyping him up. Yeah, and it's like that's that's why that's what Eduardo Escobar does. He's a great guy, he's a great veteran presence. Like seeing the joy he had for like a young player who's like almost taking his job in a way, it's kind of it's beautiful to see. It's it's very um, I don't want to say humbling because it's not anything to us, but like I think it's a it's an and it's an experience that's. Uh, wholesome. I'll say it's very wholesome. I think that's a better word to use. Also, what was the tweet underneath it? Remember you sent me and you're like, I want to talk about this because just to go off on Eduardo Escobar a little bit here in a good way, this dude on and off the field seems to be an absolute, uh, gotta love this guy. Yeah, this is from Jim Brosnan. See, I got the name before I start talking about the tweet Nice, this time. nice. Un- under the seven line tweet that was quote tweeting as the motorcycle goes past. Rude that, interruption. Unbelievable. Do they know we're podcasting in here? Must not. Should Must tell not. Them. They should be following Mets stuff on all <laughs> social media so they know. Oh, there's tons of Mets up stickers all over my neighborhood. They know, <laughs> oh, they I know. They, I, I hope they know. But Jim Brosnan, at Jim Brosnan on Twitter, he said, a buddy of mine, a Yankee fan, met Escobar doing volunteer work in Queens. He sent me a pic saying, doesn't this guy play for the Mets? And he said, Escobar showed up to a volunteer gig alone, introduced himself to everybody as Eddie, and worked alongside everybody else. That's sick. That's just a quality guy. And, like, also, Eduardo Escobar, if you're not a baseball fan, 
he's like five ten, like yeah. kind of in his like mid 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 late thirties. Like you're not good. He's not going to stick out like <laughs> at the volunteer event in Queens. Like that's just amazing that he did that. Yeah, it's crazy that he would give his time. Like any like you would think a lot of these guys, any time that they have off, they're probably like, I want to do nothing. I want to relax. I want to watch some TV, maybe play some video games, whatever they're doing, watch a movie. And Ward Escobar's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend my time and try and make someone's day better than you know it is right now. Which help, gotta help. respect that. Help by his community. Like, it's yeah. just a beautiful thing. Help by your community, especially when you, like, have as busy of a schedule as a major league baseball player. But this was Wednesday night's game. Certainly the best one of the series. The only yeah. win. A lot, a lot of good. Some bad. Love seeing Brett Beatty. And then we get to game four on Thursday with Jacob deGrom on the mound. And you had this feeling like, okay, we can salvage this right here, right now with our ace versus their ace. Yeah. Like, mano y mano. This is a team... We kind of talked about this a lot in our second half preview episode. That all these games are coming against the Braves. This was the season. This was everything. These this collection of games, and now we've played nine, twelve against them since that episode. And like you saw it, like this was kind of the culmination of this entire stretch. Mm-hmm. And Degrom was so good early. He just mowed through this order, and then the top of the Braves order, second time around, it seemed like something clicked. They finally got a hold of something. To be Dansby's- fair. Watching his slider just was not breaking. His slider no, it was, was not and, sharp at all. And both of the hits, Dansby's double and Austin Riley's single, each scoring the two Braves runs, were off of sliders. Yeah. And the command on it was still perfect. And there was the there was those three innings early in the game, like it seems like there always are, where DeGrom throws every single pitch in the exact same spot and the hitters don't know what it is until the last moment. They can't hit either of them. The strikeout against Ronald Acuna to start the game was like not, not fair. I, 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 I'm not going to say I felt bad for Ronald Acuna because I never, never would feel would. bad for him, of no. Of course, but I just, then that moment, I was like, that, that is, that is, this is the greatest pitcher of our generation. We just saw why. Yeah. No, he was, he was so sick. He, he was tinkering a little bit too because after the slider was having some difficulty, he started going to the changeup and curveball more. And they talked about how Chris Bassett thinks that Jacob DeGrom's changeup might be one of the best changeups in all of baseball because he's like, he's like, one, like he doesn't throw it, so no one's really expecting. He's like, but two, like, it's just so good. He's like, it's unbelievable that he doesn't throw it more. That he basically, I think up until that time in the game, he had thrown 93% of his pitches as fastball slider. So apparently they're trying to maybe tinker with throwing the curveball and the changeup a little bit more more as well. And I think that probably is something that he wants to do and he's done these last few starts. Once he gets to that third time around the order, which is yeah. what he did again, a little bit to the second this one. It's also got to be funny from Chris Bassett's perspective. As amazing as Chris Bassett is and has been this year with the Mets, Jacob DeGrom changeup is harder than his sinker and fastball. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's not It's fair. like sitting 92-93. Like, Bass has got to reach back to get that. <laughs> Watching him pitch, like you said, like, there's just times where you're like, wow, yeah, he's just the best pitcher we've seen, like, probably ever in our lifetimes. And you hear other pitchers talk about him, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you could stay healthy. And you watch him pitch, like, just four starts, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, he's so sick. He's so unbelievably good. Trevor May explained to us best. He's like, this guy, he's just different. Like, he's just different. And you can see it, and you feel it, and you watch it. He's so good. It's also been very cool. I saw a lot this series that whenever Max and DeGrom are not on the mound, they seem to be just completely attached at the hip. Right next to each other. Which, they are buds. I was talking on the phone with one of my buddies today. Shout out Reed. He used to be a big, uh, big fan of this show, but he said he stopped listening since we went Hollywood. Because at first he was, a, <laughs> at first he was supporting his friend, and now Small he said, I'm getting, and now he said I was getting enough support. So he, wow. he we lost one listener there. So shout out Reed that. for that. I'll one. remember that Reed. But he said that there's basically almost no one else on earth who can actually have a conversation as a high level of pitching as those two guys can. It's pro- like, there's like Ker- seven guys: Kershaw, Kershaw. Wainwright. Yeah, and like Wainwright's like never even been nearly as good as those guys either. No, I know, but just like a pitching conversation. I guess he's, Wainwright's never been a high level like these guys, but there really isn't like and the fact these two have each other as a resource Verlander. Talk all the time. Yeah, Verlander, of course, but it's it just has to be such an unbelievable experience for them, the other coach, the other players in this team, the coaches, the young guys, like everyone involved in this organization right now, being able to see those two interact and like the information they can share and disseminate, and just the experience that exudes off of them, it's. It's unbelievable. It's five, w- five, si- five Cy Young's down there. It's like... I, I want Tyler McGill around them at all times. He should also be attached to their hip whenever possible. Oh, he should He should not be allowed to be less than 10 feet from Max Scherzer or Jacob DeGrom if they're get in a, the facility. Get him a shot collar that's attached to <laughs> Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer. If he gets too far away, he gets buzzed. <laughs> get back there. Get back there right now. Go talk to him. Ask him a question. Are you working on your grips? How's your slider? How's your changeup? Work on the grips. Hold, hold the ball. Hold the, like, you know how like what, it's like training camp season right now in the NFL? Whenever running back... 
fumbles. I saw like a third string or fourth uh, string of the Steelers it. fumble. You just walk around the whole, walk around all day with a ball. Tyler yeah. McGill should be doing that with a baseball. Slider, <laughs> change up. Slider, just change up. <laughs> but it's just, it's so cool to see these guys like be able to cultivate seemingly this like amazing friendship that's uplifting yep. as this team goes on. But we got to get back to this game because the yes. Mets are losing 2 nothing with DeGrom. He was delightfully awesome besides that little tiny little rally, even until the end. Mark Hanna tied up with a big home run. Really got the boys buzzing. Mark Hanna, a good couple games here after a bad few weeks. Marky Cheerios. He's get he's a guy that maybe more consistent playing time helps him. He I, I think I mentioned to you off air, but his pinch hitting numbers, I think, for his career are not particularly bad. strong. So he might just be a guy who needs to be in the rhythm of a game. And that being said... Him and Naquin, relatively speaking, their numbers are like the same. And like Can has been hitting righties this year, hasn't really been hitting lefties. Which so, is which is like super weird because that's like the opposite of what he's done in the past. But I think right now, like, and Buck's doing it seemingly, you got to ride the hot hand. Like, unless there's like a super tough righty, you know, you, you play Canna. Of course. And the beauty of it is that either of those guys are very valuable pieces off the bench because they can both run. And I get, I know Canna's pinch hit. Stats aren't great, but I'm not. I'd rather take what he is as a player rather than a small sample of being a pinch hitter. Like yeah. both those guys give you a lot off the bench. It's not the worst thing in the world to have a very good hitter off the bench, but that got the boys going, got the game tied, and then Degrom comes out for the seventh, two outs, pretty nondescript, and then it's a ground ball to third. Beatty, you know, trying to still make his impact, a little overzealous yeah. with a ball in the hole. Someone fast, uh, Vaughn Grissom was running, who we mentioned has good wheels. So I don't even know if the ball that got deep to Lindor, he even would have gotten him at first, would have been a bang been bang play. Would have been tough, so I'm not going to fault Beatty for that one. And then with 95 pitches, Buck comes out to get the ground, which I get because I definitely don't want him to go to 100 pitches. But Michael Harris was coming up, who just looked so foolish in his two at bats against Jacob Degrom. Yeah. But there are so many things at play with a Degrom outing that I can't. Of course, I'm not going to. I'm not going to fault no. anybody for this decision. But I did think it was a little bit weird just because of how poorly Harris looked. But then Lugo came in. I I can't say he didn't do his job against Michael Harris next. It was soft contact up the middle. It, it, it's Monday morning quarterback, like shoulda, yeah. coulda, woulda, classic stuff. I think in the moment, I also was a little bit surprised that DeGrom came out just because he's the best pitcher in baseball, but you also... It just hard- seems like they It seems like they don't want him to have that many high leverage pitches once he gets past 80. And I think when you see him pitching the way he does, it's really easy to forget that this guy hadn't yes. pitched for a year prior to that. So like, again... Long season. That's for making the playoffs. Like we're the season is much longer than just this one game against the Atlanta Braves. As much as we would have loved to have won it, there's also a world where Jacob Degrom doesn't get Matt, Michael Harris out, yeah. and then you get the top of the order, and then you wait. Now what do you do? And then Lugo comes in. Like I think the process was right there. I think the decision making was the right move on paper. It just didn't end up paying off, and it's because a slow dribbler got through the middle, and Brandon Nimmo is playing on the warning track. Like it's just. And it was almost just perfect almost storm. Just, it was a perfect storm. It just seems like it shocked the Mets at Von Grissom round the third without hesitation. I think and a like little you, bit. You got to just kind of tip the cap to the young, hungry player there. Great aggressiveness. We saw Jeff McNeil do that and get us a nice, substantial lead in Sunday against yep. the Phillies. Like sometimes you just you kind of feel like you're in the zone and you can make a play. Force you, make make the other guys make a play, and that's what Von Grissom did there. And again. You tip the cap. Like, it sucked, but they stole a run, and that that's the difference. Yeah, would have loved for Nimmo to make a better throw. Uh, I don't necessarily know why the throw— he, it, No, it seemed like he was shocked. Maybe like, a little He, almost, he like, double-clutched double a little bit, and he got the ball in. It was weird. It yeah, was I, know really after, weird. I know after the game he was talking about, like, that basically by the time he got to the ball, it was, like, basically not rolling. So he's like, I knew. Like, as soon as the ball was hit, he was like, I got to come up throwing. But it, I, I think it's a little bit harder when the ball is, like, kind of at a stop than when you have, like, a hard ball hit and you can kind of run through it. Throws got to be better. Was hoping Nimmo would have made a better throw because he was definitely out if there was. And it's also I- ironic because like Nemo and the other Mets outfielders were playing relatively deep to avoid a double because yep. you don't want to let a ball go over your head in that instance. And the ball was hit so slowly into that long outfield land of grass, and it just died. And like the no doubles defense, which is completely the right decision, yeah, it gave up the run not in the opposite way. Yeah, because the ball was hit too softly, too far in front of you for a guy who is fast with good le- re- legs on base. Like we said, perfect storm. Stunk, uh, you know, would have been nice if Nimmo could have made that throw, but he didn't. He had a rough day. He's kind of been playing rough a little bit recently, which I think has led to some people, you know, just having a conversation of whether or not Nimmo should still be leading off. And I, I think there's some truth to the question. Uh, we pulled up the numbers here. Shout out to our boy John, our producer, got stats for us. So 
through watching the games, we've noticed that the last few episodes we've been talking about that Brandon Nimmo seems to be a little bit more aggressive than normal, especially after, after the, the first, first inning. inning. Yeah, yes. especially after the first inning. So I was like, I wonder what the average amount of pitches seen is for Brandon Nimmo from the first half and second half. First half, he was seeing 4.2 per at-bat. Second half, he's seeing 3.7. We've seen his walk rate drop below 10%. He's definitely going through a bit of a lull right now, and it leads you to ask the question is, should he still be leading off? And I, what do you think, James? What, what, what's, your, what's your thought? I'm... I'm partial to Brandon Nimmo leading off because I've just seen his ceiling as a leadoff hitter, and I think his ceiling as a leadoff hitter is higher than any player on this team. There's so much noise going outside. My is someone right now, is someone making a phone call? It's I can't believe how loud that is on the third floor that I live on. It's it's <laughs> almost and with my all my windows are closed. Nothing's open here. We are we're cutting off as much sound as possible. I flipped around my desk to point my microphone away from my window to see and how to much fair, we can get rid of. Definitely made a difference. It has definitely yes. so good. Shout out to me. But I've seen Brandon Nimmo just have a higher ceiling in the leadoff hole than any other player on this team, probably besides Francisco Lindor. But Lindor is hitting the ball so well right now that I really I want him in an RBI spot. And that third spot has really been a home for him. And heading into this game, he has struggled. But even the last four games, like Nimmo had a hit in all of them and a walk in two of them. Yeah. So it wasn't like he wasn't getting on base like we want but it just seems like there's a little it just his approach is different than what we've seen in his career to this point and i think part of that is the fact he's just hitting the ball better than he ever has part of that is he's in a contract year part of that is just i don't know maybe he's just he, he's more confident than he's ever been so he wants to swing more but i i remember a quote from aj hinch in the um which i know we're not talking about aj hinch that much anymore yeah pretty pretty unceremonious uh, season in Detroit, but he was very—he was a good manager before all the cheating stuff got uncovered. And there was a quote from him during what I re- remember as a tw- the 2019 ALCS, when they were playing the Yankees for, I think, their second ALCS consecutively, or second, second out of three. And in that series, Aaron Boone, who was a slightly less experienced manager, I believe that was his first year with the club, or was that George Rice last year? Whatever it was, the Yankees in that six or seven game series were mixing and matching their lineup day after day. Yeah. And the Astros had literally the exact same lineup, all the same hitters in the exact same spots every single day. And they asked Hinch about that. And he said, hey, these are baseball players. These are creatures of habit. A lot of these guys in this team who are playing well are young guys. These guys want to come to the park every single day and not have to think about these little things. I want them focusing on the real things that matter. They want, I want them to be comfortable. And I want them to be, I want them to be as they know and they, and they are. I kind of lost those words at the end there. But basically the whole crux of that is like there's a comfortability that this Mets team has had so far with the success in this lineup. And it's not like Brandon Nimmo is playing poorly enough in the leadoff spot to be like he can't do it anymore. Like yeah. he looked really bad tonight against Max Fried. Brandon one of the best left-handed it, pitchers in the game. Yes, and Brandon Moe's career is still better against righties and lefties. Like yeah. he's, he's really evened out these splits. It's not like when he was younger when he didn't really play against lefties, didn't lead off against them. But it's still something that, and it's just that's true of a lot of left-handed hitters in this game. Like it's hard to face these left-handed pitchers. You don't see him as often. And these, Max Free has two really good breaking balls. Like the guy's a really good pitcher. So I just I I wouldn't waver on Nimmo in the leadoff spot. If we get to September and things, he's still just like the approach is off. Maybe I would do it for him just to clear his head and move him down to four, like to five or six. Get McNeil a couple reps up there because he's doing it. Get Marte or Lindor a couple reps up there because they can do it. Like there's enough leadoff hitters in this team. Where if he needs to clear his head, sure. But if I have to have any hit or lead off in this team once we get once it has to get nitty and gritty, like I still want it to be Brandon Nimmo. No, I think that, I think that was a pretty good explanation for your for your reasoning. I, I can buy that. I can totally yeah. buy what you just said. And I do think that there is something to keeping a lineup relatively consistent over a season. So like you said, they don't have to think about the little things. I mean, really at the end of the day, it was tough this game. We have that weird ninth inning too where Shout out James McCann for getting a leadoff double in the eighth. Huge, huge double. I, didn't like, almost, I thought we had some life there for a second, yeah. but <laughs> he's been struggling. But that was a good, good little hit for James McCann. And then three ninth hard, inning, three, three hard hit balls on uh, Wednesday, and then that double on Thursday. So maybe the bats waking up a little bit. There we, we pray. go. We pray. Now, the ninth inning to talk about here because we have that crazy play that happened there. I can't. Lindor, that Lindor gets on uh, with an, a leadoff, leadoff single, hit? Lead yeah. single, leadoff single, and Kenley Jansen's on the mound. With Travis Darno behind the plate, right? Which is just a combination for you could basically crab walk to second base and steal it. Like <laughs> Kenley Jansen, walk, somersault. K- yeah, Kenley Jansen takes forever, and Travis Darno's got a little baby arm, so <laughs> you could steal that base backwards. Like think of the slowest way you can move. Roll like if there was a fire stop, drop and roll, you could get there. Francisco Lindor, yeah, moonwalk. He steals on the first pitch, 
And I mean, he could have stole third on this pitch as he well. He could have rounded. It was, he could have walked in there. He oh, had such a good jump. And Pete, granted, he got a pitch to hit. And I think Pete, Pete should swing at pitches that he can crush, right? Yeah. Didn't crush this one, though. Popped it up into no man's land. So you have Francisco Lindor sliding into second and then realizing, oh, my God, I'm about to be doubled up. I need to run back to first base. But Dansby Swanson, Swanson doesn't get over there quick enough. The ball drops, and they just throw it to second for an out. Do you think that's what happened? I think Ronald Acuna saw what was going on and let the ball drop. I think maybe, it looked like maybe, he was aware. Because Acuna maybe, was the one who was closest to that ball, and he had the position to throw. So I was and just saying going maybe, to pick it up. maybe Ronald Acuna did, but I think Dansby was going for it. I don't think Dansby had No, an for idea. sure. And I think Lindor was kind of reading. They both ran hard at first, and Lindor put his head down to try and get back. And I think Acuna, just being the unbelievable baseball player and athlete that he is, was pretty aware of it. And it is a ball crazy risk. Him. It's crazy risky though, because well, if you, because if he if he would have stayed halfway, Acuna catches that ball and guns him at first because he's only forty five feet away from first base. Like you, it was almost a no win situation when Lindor was running on the pitch yeah. and Alonso swung. Yeah, no, I really wish Pete would have held hit back the ball on that. In that spot. Yeah, yeah, I wish he would have held back because Lindor had the easy steal, as we saw later in the uh, inning when Devin Marrero, who pinch ran for Pete Alonso, stole second base as if he was one of the fastest players in the league, it's just because that combination's just free to steal off of. Wish it would have gone the other way. It didn't. That was just kind of a, a perfect summary of this Mets series. The Braves were working their voodoo magic. That's surely the only way they could beat the Mets now. They're a good team. Uh, it's just the breaks didn't go our way this time. It's going to happen. It's baseball. It's a 162-game season. We can't have every single series be won. Can't win every single game. And the Braves are defending World Series champions and a really good team. And we told Mets fans, again, at the at the All-Star break, when we realized, we circled this these like three series on the schedule. Yeah. We said, this whole season is going to come down to these three series. And when you take them as they were in totality, three games in Atlanta, five games in New York, four games in Atlanta, the Mets won 2-1, the Mets won 4-1, and then the Mets lost 1-3. Yeah. So quick math here, that comes out to the Mets winning three, now two, plus four the- is six, seven wins versus three four five losses you went seven and five in these 12 monumentally important games against the braves in the games that you played against the braves you you went plus two games in the standings yeah. if you look at it as a total with everything that happened here you can't help but be like happy about it no yeah i mean like and, and we've said it the the division goes through the mets in atlanta whoever wins that series is probably just going to end up winning the division and the mets like you said kind of we still have that advantage we still are three and a half games up this division was close before and the Mets were able to separate. Mets have an easy schedule coming up, so the Atlanta Braves. But this team is 33 games over 500. I don't think it's time to panic yet. I don't think it's time to... Fr- Actually, I don't think there's ever a time to panic with this Mets team, really. You're 33 games above 500. That's kind of where I'm going to end it. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine finding... A, like, I mean, I know I could. I'm not going to say anything. But like w- things that happen on the field for the next couple of weeks probably not a reason. Oh my God! Did you just hear my stomach there? Yeah, that was shocking. I was nice. I, thought, I, was lo- I was looking around my room for the demon. It was like, like it was who like made a, that noise. It was like a coyote or a fox squealing in the middle of the night. That thing was loud. <laughs> it came to the microphone. Oh I can't believe that. All right. So, well, since my stomach is probably saying that that por- portion of it's done, I figure we'll do a quick little therapy session because there have been some tweets that are funny, yeah. and I, I'd like to comf- comfort some of our fans. Uh, Think of me and James's bald men, maybe Dr. Phil, you know, one of the f- most famous therapists I guess there is out there. Is he a therapist? I don't even know what he is. Is he a doctor? I, I, he, I don't, I don't really know what he is at all. I feel is like he, now he just he takes anything? like TikTok kids and blows them up even more like the he's, Catch Me Outside girl. He's big on TikTok now. He's, he's pretty hip. He does all the memes. Yeah. We're, we're, we're hip on TikTok, I think. I think we're starting to get there. So, oh, we're uh, there. Yeah. Think of us as Dr. Phil. I've pulled up a couple of them that particularly I feel like talking about. This one comes from Crying Flores, which I think is a funny at, and his picture is just Wilmer Flores crying, of course. That's a good one. Braves are actual contenders. The Mets ain't. When you don't have a good pen or GM, you won't win. And it's like, oh, come Buddy, buddy, listen, listen, listen. First off, the Mets are good. We are still in first place. 33 games over 500. Still, like, what, one of the five best teams in baseball? The Braves are also a part of that group. Like, I I think you're right. The Braves are actual contenders, but the Mets are very much contenders. Do you not remember when the Mets took four or five from the Braves just last week? Like, it's so crazy. How quickly <laughs> and two people, or three, two weeks before that, also in Atlanta? People quickly forget how good that they are. Like, they beat DeGrom. We had Scherzer win. But, like, their beating of DeGrom wasn't even, like, they crushed him. Like, they scored three runs. Like, whoop de do. You you scored three runs, the Mets scored two. Like, you, they played better. That happens. I just, I don't know. People... 
people are just so quick to root against the Mets, like people who are supposedly Mets fans. It's like really well, upsetting. Remember the uh, the given stat that we saw tweeted out? I'm not going to mention who because I won't give him any prop. But yeah. after he had the, the blow-up inning against the Braves in game one, someone someone of note uh, tweeted out Michael Given's stat line because he had a bad game there. So it was six appearances and one and a game that didn't matter, a poop fest as we call it. And he was saying like he's been less than stellar. Today he came into the game in a he tight awesome scenario tonight. and he struck out the side. Like it's he, just... It's so funny how people get caught I also, up. In the I believe narrative. it was top the top of the order too. That it was, yeah. He was he, he was awesome. lights out. Yeah. So like the narrative stuff is just so ridiculous that you know the Mets don't have a good pen. The Mets have a have a solid pen. It's, it's I don't know why pen. it keep gets it keeps get thrown under the bus like it does. And the Mets pen got crushed this series because R.J. Alvarez <laughs> had to come in in the third inning of a game. Yeah. Like I, I don't understand like what people wanted from this Mets team, and, this, and he like, did a good, and he did a good job too. RJ a fine Alvarez. job. I'm, I was thrilled with RJ Alvarez's appearances, but like even just this series knocked the Mets full season bullpen ERA from the uh, ninth, tenth best in baseball to the eleventh best. Oh wow! What a what a upper third of Major League Baseball. What a bad bullpen the Mets have. It's a good bullpen, man. It's it's annoying when people say this Mets bullpen is bad. It's not like a lights out bullpen. I'm not telling you it is. This isn't like the Yankees from two years ago. Or like the, that crazy Royals bullpen, or the Mariners this year, or the yeah. Orioles this year, even the best bullpen in baseball down in Baltimore. But the best bullpen's not bad. I also got another funny tweet that I'm going to read out here. This one comes from, um, you know, Fire Tom Thibodeau, and the, the rest will leave out. But the Mets lineup is nowhere near to that of the Braves. Mets have way too many automatic outs in that lineup, who also make weak contact. Which is kind of funny because if you look at the Mets WRC plus for the entire season, which is considered to be one of the better offensive stats in terms of you know stat categories, mm-hmm. the Mets are fourth in all of baseball, only behind the Dodgers, Yankees, and Astros, who I think probably every baseball fan would say are the three best offenses in baseball. For sure. So the Mets are fourth. The Braves are eighth. If anything, they're very similar <laughs> offensively and how good they are. The Braves and Mets play different types of offensive games where the Braves are very reliant on the home runs and strike out a lot where the Mets put balls and play a lot more. But this Mets team is good offensively. I don't, I don't, again, I don't know what people want to see to prove you, to them that the Mets are good offensively. You have to score 10 runs a night and not lose the rest of the year to oh, okay. help for these people to be okay. So also, we are. Play on would be the show on rookie, is what you're talking about. Yeah. Me. We are having some fun calling out a lot of these crazy, like, fate, 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 fate what's the word? Like, fatalistic? I don't know. People who are, like, class half gloom. empty. Yeah. Yeah. But there were the overwhelming response from at least our community on Mets Twitter after this was generally, like, okay. This, I take, this this wasn't good, but there were a lot of mitigating circumstances that happened in the series, and just get on to tomorrow. And I do take I, I feel really good that the reply to the Mets up tweet was overwhelmingly positive. Yes, when that, I feel like when we first started, it wasn't like that. That makes me feel so proud for like what we've been able to create here, and like the type of just the type of Mets fans that we have following us. Like it's so yeah. wonderful that now a lot of people are like, okay, like this team is good. You can realize it, establish it. You're gonna lose baseball games, but. You can just see like more. You can see past this. We have another big series coming up this weekend that we have to focus on. And we have next week, ne- over the next two weeks, two series against good teams, even though the Yankees are reeling right now. And then we have basically like seven straight series against teams under 500 before we get back to the Braves. Milwaukee yeah. before that too. But it's just like, again, and if you look, like I said before, if you look at all three of these Braves series as one, because that's kind of how we were approaching the second half anyway, you're like, okay, this team did their job. Seven and five and twelve games against the Braves in a month is a win. That's incredible. It's one of the best teams in baseball. And you got you you won seven out of twelve games with most of those coming in their ballpark. Yeah. What's better than that? No, it's 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 good. Obviously this series could have looked a lot different, but really at the end of the day, not doom and gloom. Like like Ellen on Twitter says as our last tweet, I trust Buck and the twenty twenty two team not flipping out here. And I agree with you, Ellen. I agree with you. 100%. I, I trust this team. They, If we trust them in May, how do we not trust them now? Really? Right. Like, it's not just, and everyone overwhelmingly onto the next one, onto the next one, yep. onwards and upwards. Like, that's absolutely it. Like, everyone, it's 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 comforting to see that from us, from our, po- our folks. And speaking of, uh, before we do get going into that next series, we got to bring in our boy John here because, of course, we have the estimate. No big three today because big threes for when we win. We, we like to have fun with the big three, but... We can still do the estimate, and I have to uh, have to go like this because I won. I won you're, one, another one. You're, you're crushing me. I had a bad bad showing in last estimate. Bad showing doesn't even. Yeah, I got double. Do- I got do- I got doubled up. <laughs> it's rough. Um, real quick, James, you said something earlier. Um, I know we were kind of having our communications 
uh, silently, but Kazmat Sui and that statistic and how it's like one of the craziest things ever. So, yeah, he did homer in his third season in the bigs. He missed the start of that season in 06. Oh. Doesn't make his debut until April 20th. So his first at bat comes against Jake Peavy. Do you know what this guy did? No. He hit an inside the park home run. <laughs> So that that's like that's a crazy stat. Another crazy one that has nothing to do with Kaz Matsui, but has to do with the Met and Old Timers Day coming up. You know the stat about Art Shamsky? No, I should, but I don't. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit you with some knowledge here. So I believe it was it was with the Reds in the '60s. I'm gonna pick the year, but Art Shamsky was like a, a a really good pinch hitter. Used as that a lot, especially early on in his career. So it was 1966. And Art Shamsky hit four home runs in four consecutive at-bats over two games. And the really interesting thing is, is that on August 12th, that's when he came in in the first game, came in in the eighth inning, hit three in that game because it went 13. So he hit three home runs after pinch hitting in the eighth in a game. And then the next game, they didn't start him. They didn't start him, which is insane when a guy just hit three home runs in a row. He came in and pitch hit in the seventh, and he hit another home run, and then they pulled him. They yanked him. So ridiculous. That's another fun stat for you guys. John, I know John appreciates that as the stat man. That's that's a great one. I wish I knew that. Um, you can use it now. <laughs> <laughs> and then one more quick cap about this Kaz Matsui game. Julio Franco also homers that night. Wow. The oldest player to hit a home run in a major league game. What was that? The same game? Seven years and 240 days old. Yep. So Is that also off Jake Peavy? Because Peavy had the Mets number for all those years. I don't know if it was against Peavy. I don't think so. I think it was later in the game. The Mets won 7-2, so I think Peavy was out by that point. Cool but, I mean, people don't give April 20th, 2006 its proper due. No, no, definitely not. We have, to, we have to start celebrating that yearly. <laughs> yeah, celebrate April 20th. 2006. Hey, I think it's taken, James. <laughs> Have you guys seen any pictures of Julio Franco recently? He's ripped. He's in unbelievable shape. He's completely jacked. Yeah. Is yeah. he bigger than Soriano? I know Alfonso <laughs> Soriano also got real big in his post-playing career. <laughs> no, I think I think he's just... I think Franco's just cut. Look cut. at Soriano. I'm kind of looking right now. Oh, Soriano's arm is like... Uh, it's like one of those like fake hams that you see hanging from a ceiling. No it's so way! Massive. Look at his neck! It's crazy. How's this... Oh my God! You gotta get this guy like 200 carries right now. <laughs> Put him in the middle of the field. Jets could use him. There you go. I forget how funny Alfonso Soriano's swing was too. He doesn't really get the credit he deserves as like a marquee player for a collection of years. Oh, he was sick. He was awesome. He was so good. Well, also, the shout, old out the, shout out the old um the old box that Yes used to have on their televisions. Remember? You're shouting they, out Yes. Remember the di- but I I used to think the diamond they had was so hilarious. Where like the scoreboard was inside the diamond, they used to light oh. the bases up around yeah, the scoreboard. Yeah, yeah. That was no, cool. That was as as like a nine year old, that was cool. John, I'm not shouting him out for anything else. What do you got for us with the estimate? I've had enough Yankee talk here. Yeah, James, I don't, I don't know. I had to bring yes network into it anyway. <laughs> well, the Yankees, the Yankees can't win a game right now. It's true. That's true. true. At least we're not the Yankees. <laughs> At least we're not the Yankees. <laughs> That's a glass half full right there. All right, so we do move on to Philadelphia. Um, Jeff McNeil has dominated the Phillies since making his debut. In fact, no player in baseball has more hits against the Phillies than Jeff's 78 since his wow. Major League debut on July 24, 2018. So a lot of hits. And he's scalding hot, as you mentioned earlier, Mark. Yeah. Then we get the Pete Alonso, who has now gone 14 straight games without homering, but the longest drought of his career is only 15. So, while the averages kind of makes you think he's, he's going to homer in he's this due. series... He's also homered in three of his last four games at Citizens Bank Park. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's homering at least once in the series. What you guys need to tell me, as I lose my voice here at 1218 on Friday morning, <laughs> is what will the total number be of combined Jeff McNeil hits, and Pete Alonzo home runs in this series, a four-game series, doubleheader Saturday, long day of ball, in this four-game series against the Phillies. I think I take this one right. James, you guessed the last one? Yeah, you can go first. Okay, so, yeah, I agree with John. I think Pete's going to at least hit one home run. I'm going to say he hits two this series. Four games, I think you're going to get two home runs out of Pete. And Jeff, I'm going to chalk him up for one hit a game, and maybe he has a two-hit game sprinkled in there. So I'm going to go with seven. Seven's going to be my number. Seven. 
That's RBIs from Pete Alonso and hits by Jeff McNeil. Oh, home runs, not RBIs. Oh, okay. wait. No. Yeah, seven. You know what? Seven. Seven's it. Seven's it. I was going to say six, but I want seven. <sighs> I miscalculated. Home runs and hits. Mark said seven. That's a good number, Mark. That's, That's a good a, number. It's a strong number. We're looking at like anywhere <laughs> anywhere from like five to nine here. Yep. Oh, man. I finally set a good line, I think. I think you did too. I feel like we just guessed seven a lot, honestly. I think we like yeah, five seven and five seven. are the ones that we do. I'm gonna stall while I look up the pitching matchups just to see, just to get a sense for myself here. Well, I think I think America's rooting for Mark here. Yeah, I th- America. You think America's listening to the show? Oh, I, <laughs> well, I do know. I do know that we're an international show. We are the number one uh, baseball podcast in Slovenia. And what was the other country I said? I can't remember. Was it Ecuador? Ecuador, yeah. So shout yeah. out to our Ecuadorian and Slovenian listeners. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you for making Mets Up your number one baseball podcast. We're also climbing the charts in the UK. Shout out our boy Darren Ferguson, yeah. UK Mets, for the help there. And we've historically, in the Mets Up podcast, done incredibly well in Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. And Israel as well. So yes. we're, happy, we're very happy about all the listeners out there. Slovenia is on the come up. I've been saying that for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Slovenia is on the come up. Well, well known uh, rising country. All right. Andre Kopitar of the Los Angeles Kings, Slovenia. You had to. You, there there's you your hockey reference for the that, episode. There it is. I'm been stalling. I'm going yeah, make, to pick say a number. this estimate. Oh my god. I mean, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I, my head is telling me under. My I heart know. is telling me over. That's I how knew. it always is too. I know where I would go. I'm not going to say it out loud, but I'm going to call I, you Jacob Stallings if you don't give an answer. Yeah, come on now. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over. Wow, I can't I'm believe you went over. over. I can't believe I'm going it. Over. I'm banking on one three hit game for Jeff McNeil to give me an anchor. Okay, that's fair. That's what I'm doing. That's fair. Honestly, okay. it's it's six through it's like you said five through nine. That's that's where the numbers yeah. lie. So it's a you can't. It's going to be tight either way. Yeah, and I picked right in the middle. There we go. There you go. All right, John, thank you for the estimate. We'll check back and see Best how luck, I do. Best of luck, fellas. Talk hopefully, to you Sunday. Yeah, talk to you Sunday. Hopefully not we can, talking uh, to John until Sunday. No, I won't, I won't speak a word. No text. <laughs> not, one, not, not one iota of a After sentence. After we record this podcast, I won't speak to him. Won't We're do banishing, it. Banishing, banishing, John. Speaking of which, let's talk about that Philly series real quick because we do have it. It's another big one. Four games out in Philadelphia. Uh, yep. Noah Syndergaard's dodging us again. Oh, I need more rest. Uh. I, can't, I, can't believe he's, I can't believe he's dodging us. For some guy with the, with the moniker of Thor, he's yeah. really just fading away. He's really looking like a fat Thor that they ended and, up getting. And I've said it a couple times in the show. Like He's actually been trending in the right direction from where he started the year. Like he's throwing more breaking balls, like the slide and the curve are actually coming back for strikes. He's still not really missing many bats with the fastball or the sinker, but like he's doing well. So the shame we're gonna miss him. But we're gonna see the the uh, Phillies big two in the series once again. Friday Shocking. night we have Chris Bassett versus Aaron Nola in a pretty pretty marquee game. Saturday first game of a doubleheader: David Peterson versus Zach Wheeler. Hmm. Sunday. And then Saturday, late game of a doubleheader. We have not announced a pitcher yet. I'm assuming that's going to be Trevor Williams, based yes. on the fact he hasn't pitched yet th- in this week. They said that uh, they sent away Chris Bassett, Peterson, and Williams to Philly early because of this hellish night start out in Atlanta, which should be illegal, by the way. I can't believe they really? had a 7 o'clock game. So they sent them to Philly early. Trevor Williams was a part of that group, so you got to imagine he's Saturday, because nice. I think they were saying Sunday might be Jose Budo, who only threw wow. one inning in Syracuse tonight. And that yeah. seems like it might just be a, a, a way to get him, like, keep his arm fresh and be ready for Sunday. Interesting. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because we're we're going to assume that it's not Taiwan. Taiwan said if he feels good, he'll go, but you've got to imagine that just from a Mets standpoint, again, we don't know anything, but like yeah. you're probably going to err on the side of caution. And he said if he's not 100%, if he's 99.99999, he's not pitching. And I I almost don't even hate, hate giving him a turn yeah. off and then seeing what happens. And then you know what? If that's Jose Budo's debut on Sunday afternoon against Kyle Gibson, that'll be that'll be something to watch at least. Oh, for sure. Jose Budo's uh he's been a guy we've been shouting on this podcast since the start, so I'd love to see him get a sh- a chance. Absolutely. Righty with a fastball and a changeup. I mean, hey, let's go and beat the Phillies. The Mets bats historically hit well in Philadelphia. Now I'm really rooting for the bats gonna need McNeil and Pete to get, <laughs> yeah. get, get some knocks, but let's just let's beat this team. Nolan Wheeler are gonna be tough, but then we got Falter and Gibson after that. But you know Falter is kind of my boy, and he has actually been pitching. He has to be trending trending upwards the last couple weeks. Yeah. I like his slider and changeup. He's a guy who I think, if any of my play, like my listeners out there play deep fantasy sports, I think next year is a year where Bailey Falter becomes an actual <laughs> useful starting pitcher. I will <laughs> say the, it. Only this podcast would ever give you a deep dive on Bailey pa- Falter. That wasn't even a deep dive. I can, I can give you 15 straight minutes on <laughs> Bailey Falter. <laughs> that's, but that's, all I'll give, that's all I'll give you a little taste right now. But 
I'm going to be interested to see David Peterson's return to the rotation here, yep. seeing how he has kept himself sharp. Bassett versus Nola, it's going to be an exposition of pitching right there. I really am looking forward to seeing how the Mets respond to seeing Aaron Nola twice in one week because he's had him this year. He's had him in the past. We've hit him a few times, but he's one of the best pitchers in the National League. But we are seeing this thing with the Mets again where you kind of see the offense look a little different against the really good pitchers as opposed to the not-so-good ones. So I would like to – and we hit Wheeler last Sunday, of course. Of course we did. But there was a lot of uh, a lot of aggressive base running to play into that. I would like to see the bats wake up against Nolan Wheeler here. That would really send Mets fans back in the other direction after these couple of games. Oh, it'd be great. It'd be awesome if the bats woke up. And I think it's Philly. Anything can happen in Philly. We know that these bats can get hot. So Philadelphia is a great place for them to do Anything it. can happen in Philly. Oh, Mark, what do you mean by that? A- anything can happen in Philly. They threw snowballs at, uh, at Santa Claus. So, Well, I always say is it's always sunny in Philadelphia. I, that's the only good thing that's come out of Philadelphia, honestly, is that show, because that show is prime TV. And you know that's been I, good against Philly this year, too. So You know what I heard today? That my favorite cheesesteak place in Philly actually burnt to the ground. <laughs> what? Jim's Cheesesteaks in uh, downtown Philly. Apparently, it got it got it lit on fire. Burnt to it, the ground? I hope they're going to go back in and remake it, because Jim's was my favorite cheesesteak spot out there. Is that, the, is that the place that has the, the really good broccoli rob sandwich, too? I don't think so. I think the Broccoli Rob, that's one of the... I think that might be Geno's in South Philly. No, no, no. It's, it's definitely not Pat or Geno's. Those places... Okay. Cheese well, maybe Wiz, maybe, Jim, maybe Jim's has it, but Jim's is more in the city. I don't think they have Broccoli Rob there. Is it red and white on the inside? No, it's okay. mostly black and, black and white in the inside. Then maybe it's not that place. That's <laughs> John dropping some interesting stuff in the notes. He said Gritty is cool, and I couldn't disagree more. Gritty's... Gritty is not cool. Gritty, Gritty is the looks like Gritty cool. looks like he's something that was like conceived in like some Eastern European like tragedy. Looks like something that only Philadelphia could think of. He looks like he's like a he's like a horror character. Monstrosity. Gritty is better than Blooper though. Blooper is probably the dumbest mascot in sports. I can't go after Blooper. Blooper chirps me all the time. So on Twitter, you can chirp by a mascot. Oh, uh, Blooper chirps me all the time. Mister Met doesn't follow me. Follows you. Blooper chirps me. I think mascots have it out for me. <laughs> yeah, Mister Met does follow me. That's funny. Whatever. Oh, all right. I can't. Bloopers like bloopers like if the Philly fanatic had no had no panache. <laughs> How could you make a, such a phantasmical looking mascot have like the most bland color? Yeah, he's what beige. He's like he's like see through. He's, he's like, like he's like, like skin cement. Color. He's, he's cement like color. Natural tones. That's what he is. <laughs> he's, he's earth tones because blooper just comes out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Surely that's the only way he could be, be spawned. He was spawned blooper. That's what he was. So is the Fanatic. I can't stand the Fanatic. Uh, I think the Fanatic's one of the great... I think that's one of the good things of Philly, too. Fanatic is a pretty elite mascot, I will say that. I just give the Fanatic crap. It's just... It's just he's a loser. Well, I think that's going to wrap up this episode of the Mets Sub Podcast. We've now spoke for about an hour about the ups and downs of this previous Mets series. We'd love to know your guys' takes. Make sure you tweet us. Get in contact with us on social media, at MetsUp. That'll be on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Make sure you're following us on TikTok. Lots of good stuff dropping over there. If you're looking for the YouTube video, go subscribe to the New York Mets YouTube channel. You'll be able to find it there. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, wherever you listen, download, rate, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. We do appreciate you guys. Hopefully the therapy session help you out a little bit. We're trying to calm you down. Although it does seem like a lot of our listeners are calm. So we appreciate you. We appreciate Absolutely. anyone who's listening to this. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Peace out, guys. Peace out, guys. See you next time. Get up. Get, get up. Get up.